Welcome to Envision More. Here, we dig deep into the insights of first-generation wealth builders, unearthing stories of passion, resilience, and relentless vision. Your host is Wayne Wagner Jr., founder of Visionary Wealth Management. So sit back and dig in. It's time to Envision More. Hey, thank you for joining us today on the Envision More podcast. This is Wayne Wagner, uh, president of Visionary Wealth Management. Today, I am joined by uh, a good friend of mine and a truly impressive human being. Uh, Brent O'Mara is one of the three partners of a multi-billion dollar RIA wealth plan group. Uh, and he uh, is also a, a really successful financial advisor. But Brent's been somebody that uh, we've been partnered with strategically at Visionary Wealth for a number of years now. And he continues to be somebody who is uh, pressing the envelope for advancing the businesses and the vision for the future that he's uh, for the businesses and the fa his family uh, where he is out in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, Brent, thanks so much for being with us today. Well, Wayne, uh, thanks for having me. And uh, I appreciate the, the kind words uh, in your introduction. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah. Um, well, it's, you know, it, when I made a move G with uh, to, to change bro uh, broker dealers and RIAs six years ago, um, I interviewed 81 different firms. And uh, when I met the team from Wealth Plan, my wife was actually with me. And when we walked out of there, she said, this is where you need to be. This needs to be home for visionary wealth moving forward. And she specifically mentioned you as as one of the catalysts for that, for why she was making that call. So it's uh, you know your your leadership, your vision, and your ability to integrate and adapt technology, and 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 really, you've been doing you, you do a whole bunch of different things, but you've kind of had two big hats on. One is leader of the RIA, you know, along with Wade Balin and, and, and Todd Feltz, and then running a, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, personal practice with high net worth families and with, um, doing financial planning, personal financial planning for, for high net worth families. So, you know, that you've had been carrying two, uh, two big bags for a very long time. And that's not, that's not the breadth, the, the, the full scope of who you are and what you're involved in. So. Um. Well, yeah, it's uh, and it was never, um, you know, the, where we're at right now is it was never really intentional early on. I mean, we, we got here um, speaking of the, you know, the RIA was um, along the way when, you know, we were a smaller firm, you grow a little bit doing well, and, and that kept continuing. You, you it, the industry, you, you had to depend on a broker dealer back in the day. And they always uh, let you know that the next big thing to help your practice was coming. And yet it never did. And um, so, you know, we realized that we had to take control of our own destiny. And when you when you go out in this very lonely independent world um it's all bits and pieces and so you had to sort through the pieces and and try to build something and then um we did that selfishly just because we wanted our own practices to do well we wanted our clients to have a better experience and then once you have something like that we were just big enough to where um we, we thought we would attempt to share that with you know great advisors like yourself who are looking to think a little differently and and take your practice to the next level so um you know it's crazy how we sometimes get to one spot or the other but in in this case it was never really set out that way um very lucky that it did um and i think you know the industry right now is uh, the the amount of change and the speed in which it's changing it's just getting started and so um i think Going forward, we we've got to we've got to grow much faster and um, uh, adapt at, at a much quicker pace to to be relevant going forward. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think in the RIA space, especially if you're not moving forward and growing, you're probably getting swept downstream at this stage. Especially with the the pace of change, the pace of technology innovation, um, the onset of how AI and questions around how AI is going to change and affect the investment process. Um, all of those things are, you know, have to have to be top priorities for how we're evaluating how to grow from here. Um, so 
Brent, let's let, let's go backwards though. I mean, you you started with Felt's Wealth Plan while you were in college, right? So, you know, what, what's your uh, what's your origin story as a Marvel as a Marvel character? Yeah, so um, I get a little windy, so but that's it's a great question. I, I grew up in a town about an hour north of Omaha, Nebraska, um, town of thirteen hundred people. My graduating class, I believe, was twenty seven, and it was twenty one guys and six girls. So. You know, prom dates were uh, tough to come by, so you had to get resourceful, and you you had to friend uh, the neighboring small towns uh, so that that you can go in and 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 date some of their girls. But um, you know, it, I, it makes it makes football rivalry a little tough when you're trying oh, to date your yes. cheerleaders from the other schools. Yes, I I realized that I didn't love football that much. I only lasted until my sophomore year, and and being able to go into a town as a as an ally and not an enemy really helped out. Um, but you know, two hardworking parents, um, it, uh, and, and a couple siblings We're uh, I've got a, a brother, Kevin, he's uh, two years older than myself and, and then a younger sister, Casey. So, um, when you grow up in a small town like that in a rural community and we were, we were town kids. So most of the community is, was all farm kids and, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it was, it was unique, but it was, I, I look back now and I just, I cherish it. Um, you know, the, the community and what everybody kind of pulls together for, um, you know, when the whole town is pretty much poor, right. Um, you don't feel like you ever miss out and you're, you're without because everybody's kind of the same. And it's just, um, it's, it's kind of a cool thing. You know, it's, um, it's amazing. It was amazing to me that when I became a financial advisor, the first 10 years, I tried to talk to the people that I grew up with about being their financial advisor. And nobody wanted to talk to me about money. It took me a decade to realize most of the people I grew up with didn't have any money. So yeah. it sounds like a similar story. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, then from there, um, I, I came to Omaha. Uh, I was going to go to school at uh, University of Nebraska, Omaha obviously pretty modest means. So I knew that I was going to have to work as well as uh, so support myself to, to go to college. And uh, I was working in a kind of a manufacturing place, uh, filling uh, propane tanks and, and the winters here are nasty and that was hard work. And um, at, at the time I was really into physical fitness and I was going to the gym, met a few guys and, uh, uh, a friend from the gym said, you want to, you want to become a personal trainer. I'm driving out to, uh, what was it? Oakland, California, and I'm going to get a certification and a license and some special nutrition stuff. And so we went out there and the heck with it. we did it, came back. And the way that that worked was you, you're an independent contractor and you went around walking around the gym and I would sell them in packages of nine, 18, 54. And you know, you're walking around introducing yourself and you, know, you would point out that people were doing something wrong, might injure themselves. And, and next, thing you know, um, you know, I was, I was doing really well. And, um, I knew that as a business student, I didn't want that, you know, forever, but it was, it was a way for me to have a flexible schedule and make, you know, a, a lot of money to me at that time. So, by the time I was a junior, I knew that I had to look for an internship and then through all these great relationships, right? Cause the gym is a community of people. Um, it stuff seemed easy. You know, it was like, you just, you tell one of the people and they tell two other people and they're like, Hey, we know of a firm called Carson Feltz. Um, that, that my daughter, it was a lady. She said, my daughter's interning. She's going uh, back to somewhere else to college. And they asked her to find a replacement intern. So I go over there, I had, I, I called and I said, what do I do? They said, well, wear some dress clothes, come over at this time and you'll, you'll meet the, the two owners. And I had one dress shirt and there were the dress shirts that had the buttons that kind of went through the shirt right here. And I didn't know whether you're supposed to put the buttons through or, you know, I didn't have a tie. And I remember going in the interview and both the gentlemen made fun of my dress attire and they didn't know that like that was it i had one dress shirt right. and everything else but 
nonetheless, um, I got the I got the internship, and the uh, one of the two, his, his name is Todd Feltz, um, said, "You got it. You know, here's your hours and blah blah." And I said, "What do you pay?" He goes, "No, this is an internship." I said, "Well, I, I support myself, right? I pay for my the way I live. I pay for my my own vehicle. I'm paying for my college." And so I don't have any other means to do this. I have to get paid. So if that's the case, sorry, I wasted your time. And he goes, well, how much money are you making? I said, I'm making about 1500 per week. And I was taking, you know, like 16, 18 credit hours. And he was like, how are you making that kind of money per week at this age? And I told him, you know, I'm going around. And he goes, so you can talk to people and you, you can sell. And to me, I was like, no, no. I'm solving a problem and I just so happened to, and, and I didn't even know really what selling was. And so he was intrigued. We worked at a, a deal that I could transition kind of over time and, and uh, take my series seven and, you know, the game. But so uh, again, if I, I'm the most blessed human being on, on the planet because um, just seems like I'm always in the right place at the right time. And, and good things have ha has, have happened, and it was never something that I set out. I money is not something that ever really motivated me at all. It was um, it was a means to have a good life and things like that. But um, it just so happened I met you know a great guy that put in the time, uh, taught me the ropes, and gave me an opportunity. So uh, that's that's it's changed uh, my course for sure. Sounds like Todd was one of those early mentors that uh, set you on a path and and that, that kind of grew into much more because now you're business partners with him. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I got to give, uh, I've got my notes here, so I've got to give some credit to where my parents first, you know, being so hardworking and they never complained. So when when you think about it, looking back, I, I've got a story that I'm going to share that I didn't understand and appreciate what they did until I was 26 years old. Hmm. And you might say, why, why, why 26? And so 26 was the year my son was born. He's 18 now. Hmm. Uh, my son, Wyatt, and he was a colicky baby. And I didn't know what a colicky baby was, but I mean, my wife's going crazy. Um, I mean, it was, it was terrible. Like we were trying everything and it's like, it hit me right then. Like, here I was, 26, making great money at the time, had no financial stress in my life. And it hit me that my, my parents, who probably never had more income than $60,000 a year, had three kids, all within 18 to 24 months of each other. And they wow. made it all happen, you know? So Irish like, triplets. Yeah. So, but the the part that it hit me i called my dad it was like it was either either the middle of the night or the next morning he thought something wrong i'm like no i called him i said i just want to apologize for being an asshole kid all those years <laughs> not appreciating things as much as i i should have because of how you guys pulled all that off like it's it's pretty cool so i think that's where the hard work i was learning the whole time just by watching Right. and and then being a positive person they never complained and looking back they probably had she's a mountain a pile of reasons to to complain so um you know that was really what set me off on on being able to work hard and and um you know not not pat about the situation i was in it was like it's it's the best gift i ever got you know mm. being able to uh understand that hard work is is the norm and uh they they put me in a spot to where i can take care of myself so you said that you guys were you were guys were townies or, or grew up in town as opposed to being out on the farm um what did mom and dad do for work um uh, mom kind of odds it ends because you know we got three of us and when you're playing sports and and all that sure. stuff my dad there was a small He's the one that got me the hookup at the place to fill the propane tanks here in Omaha. Uh, he worked at, um, ended up kind of being the manager of, of uh, an, it was an acetylene plant. So they, they pumped acetylene and also medical oxygen. So 
you know, I learned, uh, I worked summers there, uh, detasseled corn, uh, but I was a town kid. So it's, it's uh, most of the kids that grew up on these farms that, um, you know, if you've ever been in a rural area, th you know, those are the families that have a little more wealth and, and balance sheet and stuff like that. So. Well, the balance sheet's usually the land and the equipment. Meanwhile, you've got an, you know, an 11 year old who's run out there running a half million dollar combine. Yeah. So that's the, that's the, the scary thing is you, you meet some of those kids in it when they're 13 or 14 and they, they know how to be own, they know how to operate pieces of equipment you've never seen before. Yes. And it's uh, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. That's so like, when you combine, I guess I would say when you combine that and then the just raw luck of, of bumping into somebody that was, was looking to replace an intern, somebody that's willing to put in the time, um, and when you're, when you're young, um, you're so easily influenced, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's the awesome thing that we should all be conscious of is like, is when young people are looking up to you, you know, they're, they're probably going to do a damn near anything. Uh, if they respect you, they're going to listen and, and, and probably follow your path. And I didn't have any clue, but this, this man gave me a, opportunity i took this test series seven and then basically he everything he said um you know i did and um not knowing any different um i don't listen to him as much anymore you know he, he <laughs> probably would say I'd, I'd rather have the 20 year old brent back but um it's uh yeah it's it's he would he would say it's important like a lot of lessons um but when you, you're looking from afar it wasn't his big house in the pool right it was i saw this guy that had a business he was respected by everybody mm -hmm. and he did the right thing and he it didn't matter if it was the janitor at night cleaning he was nice and respected everybody took the time to visit um and sure, you know, those nice things might come along the way if you, you outwork the competition. And the real changing point, and I don't know where he, he learned it. You might have to have him on your podcast and, and ask him. Right. But, um, you know, he, he gave me the opportunity and he taught me something called blueprinting. And so blueprinting in the basic form, um, and, if, and if you know Todd, like blueprinting is probably this crazy elaborate thing he simplifies it down to the very basics and uh because it works and so it, every year he would have me write down my short-term goals my long-term goals and then the action plan how are you going to accomplish those things hmm. and the unique part of that i did that i i i should share with you wayne um i've kept them for every year hmm. uh it's so much fun. I'll, I'll tell you an example of one. So the, the trick with this blueprint system he taught me was you had to write the action plan and they were in increments of a week, two weeks, three weeks. Cause you, if you go out too far, he's like, you just, it's willy nilly and, and yeah. you don't measure along the way. It's easy to get off course, yeah. but also you had to have a reward for the short-term goal that you accomplished and the long-term goal, you had to have rewards. So I look back at one and, and if I brought in, if I made so many first appointments, made so many calls, so many first appointments, second appointments, here's the AUM goal at the time, I would lose so many pounds, hit the gym so many times. And it was, it wasn't just all work stuff, but my goal was uh, a three year lease from a Pontiac Grand Am. You know, and I look back now like that was such a big deal, right. uh, but it worked, right? Right. And as you go upstream, the goals are different now, and and as you get married and you have kids and priorities change, it's um, the system still works. You know, I'm full disclosure, like now the, you know, the going through this podcast today, like thinking about that, I haven't thought about that in three years. I need to get back in the habit now of somebody of of influence around here, I need to be sharing that same system with a lot of our young staff because, yeah. um, and we can do it in a way that um, is probably a little more modern than, than that approach. But that, that really changed everything. Um, staff and kids, right? So, I mean, you've got three kids that are 18, 16 and 13, right? Yep. And uh, I mean, imagine what that would look like, would it look like for you getting started at 18, 16, 13? 
and how that might have accelerated you faster. Exactly right. You know, I in in the priorities and the goals might have been different just because of my upbringing and right. you know, dad and mom uh, to their core. You know, totally different than than this this world that I live in now. But they would have been great and they would have been positive, right? And uh, you only have so many years of influence to where all of a sudden you have your own opinions, you have your own, and yeah. it's different. We can all change, but. Uh, that's, that's why, you know, the, it, it would be very difficult to be an NFL coach, right? Because sure. now these guys are opinionated. They make more money than the coach and yada, yada, but still high school coaches and college coaches, they have this great opportunity, not just to, to influence, um, to coach, but to influence kids into being, you know, good, good citizens and great adults and blah, blah, blah. So, hmm. uh, yeah, so that, that was kind of it. Like, the parents were the core uh, irony from becoming a, a personal trainer, strangest thing. Um, and uh, then, then the path of uh, wealth management in, in here we are today. Um, right. It's just, it's fascinating. Um, how, but what, how, I, but what I hear from you is, is really, you know, one thing led to the next led to the next. So you, you learn a great work ethic yeah. from mom and dad. You you learned um, how to operate as a as a good moral ethical person, uh, and then you stepped into the gym and you're solving a problem. Like you said, you're not you're not selling. You're solving a problem. You're helping somebody identify their goals, and then you step in with Todd and 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 Carson, and you're you know. Todd's teaching you how to set goals, you know, intermediate, longer term. And so every, every step has prepared you for the next uh, along the way. So, and, and just, you know, the big man upstairs had, had a plan because I can tell you that none of that was kind of by design. It just, you get in, in the daily routine and I, I really hate keeping score. I really hate looking back and um, any sort of compliments or, uh, I just would rather focus on, you know, the stuff in, in the now and, and keep, keep dreaming. Um, because I, some of the stuff that you see, you can be influenced in positive ways when you reflect back. But I think if, if you're in the, like the present, you can see from afar, a lot of people that had better opportunities than you, um, far, far more talented, whatever it is. And they got to hear and that was it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that, that, whether it's in success is measured in all sorts of ways, but I mean, if you're somehow, some reason for, for people that get their content or whatever they plateau at right there is, is fascinating. And, and going through this process with you in this podcast, I wanted to prepare. And I don't like to think about, but I had to, I, I had to put thought into this. And so for, uh, for, for what it's worth, like this, this is amazing. And so I thought about, you know, that plateau, the most, um, the driver between, you know, getting this stream, making it, doing okay. I happened to meet a really good friend. Um, and at the time we're both starting to do well um similar in ages he's a young whippersnapper at this trucking company and his goal was to buy it out you know a smaller company at the time and i looked up to him because he was you know in, in in the grand scheme of things he was and he's never heard this um and it was never a competition it, it really wasn't but i respected him and i saw him just do these amazing things this company now does a billion dollars in revenue Mm. And, you know, he's one of my great friends and it's fascinating. And along the way, just unconsciously, I was dreaming bigger, never really was content. Um, think differently, right? Why not go ahead, take the risk, go do it. Um, that, that attitude that he had, um, has been one of the most crazy, uh, unknown subconscious, uh, things that it really just inspired me to go to work the next day and, uh, not be satisfied, right. Mm -hmm. Improve the product, right. 
improve what you're doing for your clients. It was all these things that he improved um, in this business and, and the payback comes from do, doing the right thing, trying really hard, improving, not just for selfishly yourself, but like for your client. Yeah. And uh, then along the way, um, he's the most humble, generous person. He loves to get after it, loves to party, loves to have fun, but he shares all of his successes along the way, celebrates the wins, the small wins. Mm -hmm. um, to me, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the things that I've tried to replicate in my own way, right? And he doesn't even know this, but it's, it's, it's important to have people that you look up to um, so that you, you don't get burnt out, you don't get satisfied. And, and a lot of, you know, we can all win. You, you're so successful. You could have said, I like the taste of my own cooking. Nobody does it better than me, right? And we all know these advisors, but you challenge yourself constantly, surround yourself with people that, that you respect, that um, you can steal their ideas, give their, you give the ideas back to them and you're always working on being better. And so, and, and, and never satisfied. And that to me is pretty remarkable because at some point you probably thought to yourself, is this enough? Or maybe you didn't. Yeah. Well, I think a couple of things you've said are, are really resonating with me. Number one, um, you've got this guy who I assume he's a client at this stage. So the guy who owns the trucking company. So it, there's been, there's a, a, some kind of on, ongoing relationship there, but you know, it's the, the idea of surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than you and you eventually your IQ will go up because you're in the room. And uh, you know, that, that certainly has been uh, true for me. Uh, in my career, um, number one. So um, number two, this idea that uh, of, you know, hitting a plateau um, as my kids were coming through high school and moving towards college age, uh, we would see kids, we, we would kind of help them identify the kids around them that we, we considered to be peakers. Peakers are the, like, you, they're usually the super cool kids in high school that that's life is never going to be better for that kid than it was in high school. And we all know a few of them. We've all got a few of them that we that we remember. But life was amazing for that kid in high school. Um, I have a kid that uh, um, he's he's I have no idea. He's been in and out of j jail now uh, for years. But uh, in high school, man, he was driving like a 1972 Chevelle fully rebuilt, restored. You know, he was the coolest kid with the coolest car, with the most attractive woman and, you know, all that kind of stuff all the stuff that in high school you're lusting after and he had it all. And, uh, but that was like life never got better for him than right then. And I think that ultimately what you're talking about, you know, one of the things you're talking about in terms of plateauing is that we never want to peak. Let's make life this upward journey. We may plateau for a while, but let's not, let's not make that be our final destination. Let's constantly keep our eyes on the next opportunity, the next growth mode, uh, the next beast mode, as it were. Yeah. So uh, funny, funny you should say that about high school. I went back, uh, I don't know, I think it was like a 10 year class reunion. And so, as I mentioned, 21 guys, six girls, something like that, small class. So, uh, this girl named Joelle brings the, uh, the yearbook from our senior year to the gathering. And so again, 27 people. And um, in the back of the, the yearbook for the senior class, there was a top 10 most likely. So 10 of 10 things that most likely. Right. So out of 27 kids, there's 10, 10, 10 columns here. My name's on three of them. <laughs> so, and, and uh, it was, most likely to be bankrupt. <laughs> wow. Most okay, biggest flirt, and most likely to be a billionaire. So think of the range there. Wow. And, wow. Billionaire or bankrupt? Yeah, yeah. It's like, geez, and it was you know they had a little ballot thing. Everybody voted anonymously, and so I I got a kick out of that. Um, and in sharing that moment with with my classmates, and we got a chuckle out of it, but. Yeah, to your point, like it's uh, there's a lot of people that were the, the captain of the football team or whatever that, you know, never went anywhere and never did anything. And, um, you know, there's probably something to it. 
Yeah. Well, in, in, in our family, we talk a lot about stewardship and we use that, that phrase, throw that phrase. That's kind of a, it's a biblical themed, um, but really it's, it's what you and I do every day. We're stewards of our clients' wealth, um, helping our clients make great decisions with their money and, and figure out how to accelerate that wealth through multiple generations and to shelter it from the IRS and things like that. And, but that's, you know, that concept of stewardship is, you know, when you've, when you've been given talent, when you've been given opportunity, I think it's, uh, was it Spider-Man, the, the character Spider-Man, his, his uncle says with great power comes great responsibility. And I think that's, that's true for all of us, wherever we are, um, we're a steward of this life. Right. And, and that's uh, you know, your, your journey. What you've been talking about is you're going from packing propane tanks to um, being in, in a gym and selling memberships and things like and, and, and sessions and then all yeah. the way you know, to where you are now. And it's been a, a constant layering of stewardship over bigger things. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's again, um, you, I, I don't know if most people do, but I it's it's just strange to to, to look back and reflect. Yeah. Um, and, and I just, I not somebody that does it. So like going through this process, it's, uh, it's, it's fun. It's fun. It's fun to look back and um, just a very blessed, extremely lucky person, I think. Yeah. Any other mentors you want to mention before we kind of move on? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, I'd say my just, of influence of, of things that have happened that kind of changed things. Um, you know, I wasn't like an outdoorsman. I did a little fishing as a kid. And then when I started dating my wife, Erin, in, in high school, you know, it's a neighboring town. It's all coming together now. I mean, right. She was a freshman. I'm a senior because now I have two daughters. I'm like, hell no. Hell no. <laughs> that, make, that makes my father-in-law even more of a amazing human being um because it is his nickname was big al so going over there to that first date i was i was nervous um well, well, hold on a second wait, wait, how much of a height difference is there between you and aaron oh gosh uh probably a couple two three inches i don't know did, did I, it, I keep shrinking did it, ex did it exist back then was there yeah. a height difference so, so maybe he thought his daughter could take you if you try. Probably, it. probably. <laughs> and she, she, she could have then, and she for sure can now. Um, but so every year, you know, as we date, he would uh, ask me to. He was he's a big deer hunter. Big he hunts everything. He's he's playing all over the, the map. You know, grizzly bears, and um, he went to like, I don't know, hunt all the all these just extreme cool stuff. And so he always asked me and I was like, yeah, I don't like cold weather. I'm not really, I get nervous around guns and I don't like early morning. So I don't know how. And so he asked and asked and asked and we get married, you know, so we, all this time. And so for years, and he said, you're in the family now, I'm not asking, you're going hunting. You're and it's, going me. <laughs> it's a big deal to go uh, opening morning uh, rifle season. And he, I went, I went up, I drove up the night before, here was my training. I'm still in my suit, hour north. He had a hay bale and a target. It's dang near dark. And his, he had headlights on his truck on the target. I'm in my suit. He put a bullet, he said, hey, here's, a, here's the safety. I hit the target, he goes, all right, you're good to go. <laughs> so he, uh, we wake up, it's pitch dark. Uh, I, he does, I don't know if he knows this or not, but I was actually scared because we weren't hunting together. He's like, I'm going to go over here because as much as he wanted to introduce me to this stuff, he still is a competitive hunter. He wanted his time to hunt. And so he goes, I, I tied, he goes, what you do is you go up this hill, climb under a bob wire fence. It's dark out and you go into the forest and you'll see like a, I put some orange tape on these trees, follow the little lines of orange tape and there'll be a, a, a deer blind in there. Open the door, be quiet and you're good to go. Well, along the way, every time I heard it's pitch dark, uh, pitch dark, every time I heard a twig or a leaf, I'm taking a mountain lion, I'm freaking out. <laughs> and again, my training was hitting the target. So lights coming up and, and 
and I know what a deer looks like, but I didn't know. Like, so a deer comes and it's behind a bush, like a big thicket. And I was like, does the bullet go through the thicket? Do you, should you shoot there? And I'm like, should, should I shoot right now? Should I wait? Like it's it, it just opening light. Like we're, we just started. So anyway, I was like, ah, oh, the heck with it. I shoot through the bush and that was it. I couldn't see, it was kind of down in a hill. And I sit there, that was probably seven in the morning. And at 11 o'clock, there was no like cell phone service. So at 11 o'clock, the door opens to the back of my blind and it's him. And he goes, well, I heard a shot. Did you get one? I go, uh, I don't know. He goes, what do you mean you don't know? I said, well, the deer came in down there and it went behind this thicket and it was standing behind and I didn't know if the bullet would go through. So I shot. He goes, you shot through the thicket? I go, yeah, I didn't know. He goes, well, did you get it? I go, I don't know. He goes, why not? I go, because I didn't know if I was supposed to get out of the stand. I didn't know if I was going to screw up your hunt. So I just stayed right here. And he goes, well, odds of that, you hitting that deer through all that thicket, you know, but let's the ethical thing to do. Let's, let's go down there. And it was way down in this ravine. And we get down there. He goes, the odds of this, he goes, but let's go look. And then we'll go to lunch. We go down there. Boom. Dead deer. Got him. <laughs> and through the thicket. And after that though, I was hooked. And I couldn't believe how much interest I had in, in something that was, you know, really never on my radar. Mm -hmm. um, but why that's important is I, all, the, all these opportunities it's given me to meet people, travel, see, see places, um, and the relationships I've got to enjoy. The hunting is great, but it's the, you know, the, the people around the campfire and your guides and all these great stories. And uh, now I've got to introduce my son to the outdoors. Uh, so that's a, <clears throat> that's a pretty powerful thing. Mm. Yeah. So that's a uh, father-in-law um, introducing you to a whole other field of life. Yes. Good stuff. It is. Good stuff. And now, now I've got dead animals hanging all over the walls <laughs> at, at my house in only one room. My wife gives me one room and it's my home office. Right. Uh, nowhere else. I had, I had clients uh, one time. They, they, uh, it was, a, it was the most, um, I mean, by the time you've been doing this, as long as you and I have been, we've been, we have been through dozens of divorces, right? Yeah. Because we, we live every one with clients. I went to, went to this one guy's house and uh, he and his wife and, uh, and the whole first floor was stuffed animals, was stuffed heads and skins. And it was like, he went to Africa on safari and was like, I'll take two of everything. There were just, there were skins and, and hides and stuffed animals everywhere. And, uh, and then I met his wife and his, his wife was like a yoga teacher, granola eating tofu, like meatless vegan, you know, and I'm just like, how did you two end up together? <laughs> so it sounds like you and Aaron have found a little bit better balance between the two of you. You've got one room in the house to fill. Oh yeah. She, I mean, she, she grew up that way, you know, so, right. Right. uh, it, uh, she, she's, uh, she's, she understands the, the hunting family, uh, but she, she doesn't necessarily want it everywhere else in the house. Right. Right. Well, she, she, yeah, so she understands it, but there's an, and there's an, almost an expectation. So when I got married, May, May was May, May's dad and brothers were all mechanics. So she came home six months into us being married and said, my car's making this noise. What do you think it is? I said, time to call the mechanic. I mean, like, I don't know what it is. I don't know anything about it about uh what that noise might be so it's fascinating how we marry into families and have to learn different skill sets absolutely yeah. absolutely Good. what have been a couple of milestones brent where you've kind of you, we, we're talking here about preparing for today and trying to kind of to look back a little ways and and see what some of those th those spots were but what were some some moments in your life where you're like Okay, we're we're functioning at a different level at this stage. Yeah, it's. Um, I think there's there's kind of a, there's been many like to where you just kind of pinch yourself and go wow, um, but it's uh, there's one in particular that that stands out. I don't know why, um, but you know we were. LPL was looking at, uh, which is our, our broker, former broker dealer, at making an investment 
in starting this hybrid RA. Mm -hmm. And so we, we put together our ideas and I was working on a platform, um, which never worked out, uh, but it, we we're out there. And so their executive team, uh, C-level, uh, was, was there and Todd was making introductions and he just, he just starts talking like Todd does. Um, no, no preparation, whatever's top of mind is out. Um, so I've realized that you never, so you just let him go and, and he's going and he goes, so here's the, here's the, the, the case study right here in our program. We can take young advisors and grow them if they follow the steps and yada, yada, yada. He goes, look at Brent here. Brent has 65 million in, in advisory. They had a program called SAM, 65 million in SAM. And I stopped and only because I'm so competitive, I said, Todd, I got 125 million at the time. <laughs> you know? And he's like, what? So we, we, after dinner that night, he goes, are you sure? And he goes, well, how much do, do I have? I go about a hundred. <laughs> and, and, and I was like, and he goes, I, I just can't believe it. And, and, you know, he's just not somebody that's real detail oriented and, and that the numbers don't, you know, really make him any happier or less. Like um, he was happy for me, but that to me was like, holy crap, here's the guy that taught me this, you know, I've exceeded him. He didn't know it. And, and that's okay too, um, along the way. But that was, that was something that always stands out to me um, because it kind of shocked us both, you know, at the same time hmm. and, and kind of how it went down in a, in a boardroom in, in San Diego. Right. The student has exceeded the teacher. Yeah. And that, you know, it's, that's something to where it's, it was never really a, a goal. It's just, uh, right. It, it happened and it's a good thing. I think deep down, I would, I would hope that that he, like any good mentor, like you want somebody to exceed what you've done, yeah. you know, yeah. hopefully he's, he's happy about that because uh, he should be really proud. Not, not yeah. just myself. He should be really proud for putting in that time uh, when he was already successful. You know, he could have very easily just said, I want to go do this for myself and me, me, me. And yet, you know, given, given some young person, uh, not just an opportunity, but putting in the time to make sure they, they've got a, uh, a good path. Yeah. I think the, I think that there's, that's the desire as a parent and as a mentor, right? That we would, we would have an impact. Um, I think one of, one of the crucial things in leadership is that we, we not be putting limitations on the people that are coming up under us, that, but our hope would be that we create opportunities, that we help them accelerate, that we create the platform for them to launch from, and that ultimately one day they look back and see that we were a part of their story, but we weren't the end of their story, right? Yeah, it's, uh, I was, uh, th this year, this past year, um, it's, it's, it's crazy how uh, some of the stuff comes together. But so my, my grandfather was a huge Nebraska football fan, just like everybody in the state. Uh, but obviously my, my father became a fan. We didn't have much. And so, but they'd always take me to Nebraska football games. And it wasn't at the time. I didn't know. We never went to the real game. They have a, what's called a spring game, which is like open to the public mm -hmm. and you kind of get the same thing, but I was hooked and still am a very, very passionate fan. And for years, Nebraska's rival was Colorado in the old uh, Big Eight uh, days, and their fans were known for being, you know, pretty pretty rowdy. And so this year, we were playing Nebraska's playing Colorado. Deion Sanders, there's new coach, right? And my dad has never been to an away game in in Colorado, and so I chartered a private jet, bring him, uh, <laughs> my brother-in-law. I had to bring my brother-in-law because he's like 6'5", 250. So if these mouthy fans were popping off, I had, I had a bodyguard. <laughs> uh, so my sister, brother, and my, and my dad's wife. So it was, uh, that was cool. You know, just looking from the back of the plane going, here we yeah. are. That's neat. That's a neat, that's gotta be a, a neat memory and uh, a milestone moment for you. For sure. Good. That's good. Good stuff. Um, so 
nothing amazing is ever achieved without some pain points. Um, so there's been, there's been some point where you pick your head up and go, Hey, I didn't see everything I needed to see before I made that decision. Uh, we, we kind of affectionately here at the podcast, we call them meltdowns, but, uh, you know, what, uh, have there been, has there been one or two spots where you're like, uh, I learned a life lesson. Here's what I learned and here's how I learned it. Cause it, it hurt. Yeah. Um, I, I thought long and hard, this is going to sound, first of all, I've made countless mistakes, you know, yeah. all the time. We all have, uh, right? Yeah. And, uh, there's not any like one, uh, that just like really, really stands out. Um, and so probably just talk to like stuff that's just top of mind. I, I was trying to build out, a um, a platform. Uh, for what I thought is what every great advisor wants, right? It's got customized content. It had kind of a TAMP solution. And, um, but I didn't have any money, like serious money to start this. So I went and searched. I met a great, great dude that, um, and a, a guy that was willing to put in the time that had some tech background and away we went. And, when you're when you're just plotting along and we're just doing this with uh, minimal resources, but it was coming along, uh, so it took forever, and I spent so much time. You know what money I did have, and um, and then that company ended up getting bought by LPL. Oh, gee. <laughs> and it got and it got scrapped. You know, mm. uh, so I knew then that you know. You can have the greatest ideas in the world, um, but if you don't have, you know, the money to fund it to get to market and compete, you're better off probably putting your time and your resources into something you understand a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I certainly have had uh, moments like that where I thought that success in one area would automatically parlay into success in another area. I had a the guy's still a good friend of mine, but uh, he was a mattress salesman when I met him. He was a, a regional manager for a mattress company, mattress sales company, and and he he wanted to he he thought he wanted to be an entrepreneur and be in that business. And I was like, well, you know, why don't I fund you fund fund the startup for you? And uh, a half a million dollars later, <laughs> we finally close the thing down, and uh, and it was. He, he put in a lot of sweat equity. I put in a lot, all the money. So it yeah. was, uh, but we, you know, it's, it's one of those, Hey, Wayne, you know, you might want to get just, just stick to being a financial advisor for a while. So I think I was probably a little early on the mindset of, Oh, they say millionaires have got seven streams of income. And that is true, but they didn't start out with seven streams of income. Usually they go do one thing really, really well, and then they become millionaires, and then they start to diversify their streams of income. Uh, I know for me that was a that was a tough lesson, an expensive lesson to learn along my journey, my own journey. Yeah, I think that's. I don't know if I'd call it a failure, but it's something that, um, you know, when you have excess, right? I think we're all guilty of like, oh. I got to throw a little money at this and, oh, this is going to be cool and this is going to be great. And it creates a lot of uh, distraction. And so when you wait, you, you measure like how many hours and how much, uh, you know, emotional capital was, was taken away. If you just put that right back into, you know, your core strength and your talent and, and being a great advisor, yeah. right? Uh, the payback, you will never really know how much the, the return of, of the practice was diminished because right. it's, it's still going to be good. But uh, yeah, I've, I've, I did that. And what's crazy is hypocritical. I always knew I've watched so many great clients, right? Uh, was it Biggie Big that said, mo money, mo problems? <laughs> yeah. One, yeah. Of the, one of those guys? Yep. And you go, that's so true. And problems can be distraction, um, all of this time suck out of out of your life, which is a precious commodity to where you've mm -hmm. got to track down K-1s, you've got to go to meetings, no great small business ever just goes like this. So you got to get through all the good yep. times and bad times and meetings and board meetings. 
And it's, uh, I would always tell, or they buy more homes, right? Same thing. And, yep. and uh, they got to track down the property taxes and all this stuff. And I'm like, man, just simplify things and, and you'll be happier and, and uh, you'll have more time to enjoy what you, what you do have. And mm -hmm. yet here I was speaking out of one side of my mouth. And yet if I look back, 10 years, I was doing all those things. Like I couldn't stop myself. Yeah. You know, I, I invested in a, a winery uh, and I believed in these two guys so much, but anybody that knows investing in the wine industry is it, it, it the failure rate is massive. Highly speculative, right? Oh my gosh. So, uh, we did it and it, it was touch and go for the longest time. Like there was five points in time. We should have just shut it down and persevered and now it's you know it's a wine and whiskey company that's selling i don't know you know thousands upon like i don't know if it's thirty thousand cases of wine now in almost every state and bourbon's probably twenty thousand cases wow. and fascinating in it and the the investment hasn't exited yet right it just right. got to the point now where i feel confident to where i don't have to be involved with these right. meetings all the time Right. Um, but if, if I measure probably my time and that was really hands-on to save my investment, I felt, yeah. and maybe that's a control freak in me. I felt like if I didn't step in that it was goner and, and I didn't want to fail. So, but the amount of time it took away from, you know, wealth plan group, uh, my practice, you know, probably my wife, probably my kids, like you, you think about it like that, that was a massive mistake, mm. massive. You know, and someday that thing will probably sell and hopefully for a lot of money and we'll measure that as a win. But, you know, I'll know deep down, was it really that big a win if you if you, you had the, all these other little incremental losses that will probably not be ever spoken of, you know? Yeah, well, yeah, the, the, the time investment is, is sunk capital you can't get back, right? Especially if it's if it's away from Aaron and the kids, but um the other side, I mean, you guys do have a, a really nice, really cool branding with that thing. So, and, and it's, and it's really good wine. So I'm not an aficionado and I, and I really like it. So. And it's a, uh, and it's a, it's a good price point for yeah. people that are not wine snobs. It's, it's, uh, it's, I'm proud of the guys that, and what they've done. Um, so that, that what's, is, the, what's the name of the winery, Brent? A ammunition. Right. And so. It just occurred to me. So the brand was a way for us to give back to, in my case, it, it was our, our fathers and father-in-law hmm. for introducing us to the outdoors. Okay. Yeah. Very and cool. so uh, that's kind of the story behind it. And uh, it's good wine. So. Right. And hopefully good bourbon. That's right. You're yeah. 20,000 yeah. cases a year. Of it. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, that's it's, a lot. It is. It is a lot. Gotcha. What have been um, one or two kind of milestone mindset shifts where we, we talk about having a mindset or a worldview? Um, what have been a couple of areas where you just feel like you've you've seen yourself really evolve uh, in, in uh, how you think or how you view things? We've, we've just talked about kind of applying, you know, applying ourselves and money and that kind of thing. But have there been one or two situations either in family or in, in business where you felt like you needed to really shift kind of how you were raised or how you, how you, how your family thought about money or thought about family or life or something. And, and in order to get where you are, you kind of had to change your thinking a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I think that the, you know, what, what's the saying, Wayne, of you can go fast by yourself, mm, but yep. to go far, you got to, you got to do it together with others. Yeah. Yep. Um, I think, you know, the first, you know, let's call it the first half or first chapter of my career. I got, you know, fast track from zero to, you know, 550 million under management and, the shift that I'm going through right now is I realize that I, I cannot better that without 
doing a better job of introducing more people to the team, more talent to our clientele, improve the the platform, the process, all, all of those things to where, uh, and it's really hard it, for me. Um, you know, a couple things that go into that is managing a lot of people and personalities. I have no freaking training whatsoever. Right. And naturally growing up to where um, I, I saw hard work and it's just instinctively in me. Mm -hmm. um, and then expectations when you now have a staff are everybody should work as hard as you and care as much. And that's just not fair, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, those are the struggles kind of here in the now where, and that's been, I've, I've known I've needed to try to shift this for a while. It's just been a very difficult, you know, to, to turn the boat. It's been, it's been tough. Yeah. Um, so that, that's kind of a, an issue that I'm constantly working on. Mm -hmm. um, I think I get better and better all the time. My feedback's good from people. Um, you can always tell uh, if turnover slows down a little bit, I'm doing a little better. <laughs> and so, uh, and, uh, but yeah, it, it, and also, as you know, recognizing that I'm not a, you know, professional manager to such. So with Wellplant Group, uh, it took us a long time to find what we feel is the right person to lead. And we kind of did it by committee and spun our wheels. Um, but that right now is um, tr transitioning. Uh, couldn't be more excited about it because um, us getting out of the way, you know, being, being cheerleaders, still helping um, leadership vision what we want in the end you know the product and the platform has to be great but we need a driver we've got a driver um i i want to just focus on you know meeting with guys like wayne sharing ideas and getting back to you know growing growing my business and taking care of my clients yeah yeah i think well i think um there's you and I have talked about this over the years in terms of there's only so many clients each individual advisor can actually service, right? And so over time, we've got to um, we've got to focus on the relationships that that matter the most to us. And sometimes those are it's not just the dollar numbers, right? So we'll have um, family and friends that you know, you know we're always going to be their advisor, regardless of how much money or how little money they have. Um, but we've got to build systems to build scalability into the business so that we can take care of um, the, as we have built something that people want to be, to work with and built systems that, that, that we can scale. Um, and we've got to invite other people along for the journey. So to your point, if you want to go fast, go alone. Um, but if you want to go far, you've got to build a team. And then, you know, and then you and I don't have necessarily the training or background to be kind of the CEO who is, you know, or, or should I say maybe the, the COO, right? So the, the management, the operating mechanisms of the business, we have a vision for where we want the business to grow, but then backing into, okay, well, the next person we need to hire needs to have this job description and that personality type and this skill set is not necessarily where you and I would excel. We have a vision for where we want the company to go and where the organization needs to go and, and, and how to work with the individual clients but we don't necessarily have the what's in the middle there, which is the management piece or the operations piece. And uh, that's that's an area where, you know, you say you're growing. It's certainly an area that uh, that I'm growing. So I haven't taken my, my team internally from two to six in the last two years and uh, and and looking to accelerate in the next uh, next year or two beyond that. So um, growing the support team and then ha and having those people know what they're supposed to do instead of, you know, Hey, yeah, I mean, early on it was, you know, I'd, I'd see somebody, you know, I think you would be good on my team and I'd, we'll put you on payroll and we'll bring you in. And well, what am I supposed to do today? Well, I don't know. Like just help us grow the company. Yeah. Uh, it's like, well, what does that mean? I've, I've never worked in a financial planning firm before. So yeah, and, yeah. it's uh, it is, it's unique. And that's where uh, this, this industry uh, you know, the blessing and the curse, you know, when you're independent, you're on an island, right? Yeah. Um, like our group, you know, we've got a bunch of independents, but we we can gather together, share ideas right. and that in, in a platform. Um, but it, it's still, 
you know, it's fragmented. It's so fragmented and you can do it. But the, the cool part about that is you can do it your own way, mm -hmm. right? There is, you don't have to fit into this box and, you know, look at what you're doing with your brand and in your, your, your business, you're doing it your way. Every, everything that you see in the end, you're mapping out and you're checking it off the list. Right. Yep. And, um, that's, I mean, it's, it's in the name of your, your company visionary. You're, you've got this vision. It might be different than many of the guys in our, even our, in Wealthlink group, the, the RIA, um, but you're doing it your way. And that to me is that it is, we're entrepreneurs at spirit. Um, and we're, we're, we get the opportunity to serve these great clients, but the, the fun part of always trying to do, to, to make it better at the mousetrap and work on the mousetrap, um, is, uh, is, is pretty cool. You know, I don't think most clients would ever really understand how hard groups like yours and ours, Wayne work to improve the product, mm -hmm. right? That to me is they think, oh, it's the investment guy and, and, and he's nice and they do a good job, blah, blah, blah. Like we're working constantly. It's never good enough, right? Always want to improve it yeah. uh, for their benefit. Yet in an industry that you charge on average 1%, even though every everything's costing more these days, and yet we're trying to add more value. <laughs> yeah. So it's just uh, that's – that's going back to my friend. If, if you have the great um, product, right. And you approve that everything else takes care of itself. Yep. Yeah, you're right. Um, and I mean, the, the great companies, you know, Elon Musk with Tesla. Um, um, yeah. Um, Apple, Steve jobs. Um, you know, they, they work on, the client experience, you know, what do they want? What, what the, should the client experience be? And that's ultimately where we spend our, you know, spend our time trying to improve uh, the outcomes for clients. And while we may generate our revenue off the wealth management, ultimately the tangible outcome of our work is clients who can sleep well at night, knowing that they're, that, that the big decisions about their money are well, in, in good hands and being well taken care of. Um, and ultimately, they'll spend less with the IRS because of the work that we're doing. Um, they will um, they, they will grow their wealth more effectively and efficiently, and they'll be able to accelerate to their children, accelerate to, to their children and grandchildren more efficiently uh, because of our work together. Right. And uh, and and you're right. You and guys like you and I wake up. The things that wake us up at three o'clock in the morning is 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 not necessarily which which stock should we buy, but it's how could we plan better for that client situation? How could, uh, you know, what if we implemented this strategy with that client? How much would that save them? How much more would that make them? How much more efficient would it make their plan? So, and that's, uh, it's, it's the, it's the bane of, uh, it becomes a bane of our existence, right? Is, you know, it's because we're constantly, you know, the brain never shuts off. So. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, you nailed it right there. I mean, it's when you're, Constantly trying to do better for your client, whether it's saving them money on taxes, avoiding, um, you know, probate costs, things that can easily be overlooked yeah. um, is uh, is just something that you, you just when you care so much um, and you understand what a huge responsibility that is uh, being the steward of somebody's uh, wealth. It's uh, it just comes second nature at some point, And that's what differentiates, you know, the average guy from great advisors like yourselves. Yeah. Well, it's, it's fascinating today for doing a, this as long as we have, I mean, we have situations where we're working with three generations. We're actively working with three generations of families and the fourth generation who's just being born. We're the, we're setting up the college accounts now and that kind of thing. So we're actually working with four generations of, of family trees. And that, that's, that's a humbling thing to think about where we're, you know, responsible for multi -gen overseeing multi-generational wealth on behalf of these clients and helping that wealth accelerate effectively and efficiently. So, yeah, it's, um, it, it is cool, you know, three, three generations and, you know, the compounding effect of your, your influence, your, your footprint, when you start looking at the amount of taxation, you know, the above average growth, right? Keeping it out of the hands of the IRS, yep. whether it's a state 
all of those things, uh, having proper insurances when needed, you know, all of those things, um, you know, it's to me, it's if, if people really understood it, we would be able to charge a hell of a lot more. And I think it's worth every penny. I, I really do. Yeah. You know, if I, if I was on the other end and I was a client and I knew what I know goes into how much is saved in taxes just because we do it, you know, we didn't ask them, we right. do it because yeah. of this, because of that. And you compound that over not only one generation, but two and three, yeah. it's, it's a massive amount of, of money. So it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, and, and that's where I, it's, I have no problem asking for 1%, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. And I think, I think that the, you're, you're absolutely right because a financial advisor who's doing the right things for their clients, they, they, again, the revenue may be generated off the 1% on assets, uh, the revenue to our firm, but the value that the client is receiving should be exponentially more, not just through the wealth management, but through the tax planning, through the estate planning, um, through the the lifestyle income planning, through the healthcare planning, through retirement, those kinds of things, and and that's where you know it, it's fascinating to think about how AI is going to change and adjust. But the people who are focused solely on well, how can I get a a cheaper mousetrap, um, or how can I cut the not not need a financial advisor and just go index everything? Um, those people ultimately are missing. The, the much bigger picture where, you know, the, the, I mean, the IRS and the federal government has conspired for the last 50 years, in my opinion, to, to take people's retirement savings from them. Cause we look at what they're doing with 401ks. They'll give you a tax deduction when you're in a 12% tax bracket to put money in your 401k, you know, and they'll bribe you with the tax, de with a tax deduction when you're in a 12 or 22% bracket. And then when you're retired and you're in a 32% bracket, they're not just taxing the seed you put in there. They're taxing the whole damn crop. Yeah. And, you know, but they, they told you, I mean, I had, I had a client years ago that by the time he left his company um, and he had put a huge percentage of his, uh, of his qualified, uh, excuse me, of his deferred comp money away when he was in, he was a single guy. He got successful really early. He put a ton of his money away when um, he was in a 22% income tax bracket and, or what today would be the 22% income tax bracket. And when he ret when he left the company, there was $6 million in that plan and he lost 53% of it to the IRS and the state in the year that he left. And, and he was wow. mad. At, he was mad as hell. He was, he was mad as hell because, you know, a guy, and it wasn't a financial advisor that told him to do that. It was one of his mentors at the company who was, it, it, the guy was well-intentioned. He was, he was telling him, Hey, you, you should be putting away, you, you're, you're qualified for this deferred comp plan. You should be using it as a forced savings account, put away as much. So he was putting away like 25% of his, his base income and a hundred percent of his bonus every year. So by the time I met him, he had over three, three million bucks in the plan. And I'm like, you realize the day you leave, it all gets taxed on the same day. Right. And he's like, no, I didn't realize that. So we stopped using it at that point. But by the time he left, it was still six and a half million bucks. And he was, he was furious. And, uh, it was, you know, but that's the, that's the, the, the strategy, small pieces of the strategy over time that compound either to the benefit or to the punishment of our clients. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah. called tax deferral for a reason. Eventually it's yeah. due in um, the, the, t you know, the, the decisions you make today, eventually, you know, it, it, the, the bill comes due. Yeah. So, and as you know, like the, the tax software that, uh, you know, wealth advisors are putting in play in their practices now, it used to be, you know, we'd have a little tax guide and, you, yeah. you know, you'd, you'd help people out and you hope that you did it the right way and gave them some sound advice. But now with the software that we're utilizing to help minimize or maximize, you know, marginal brackets, yeah. it's it's fascinating that how much value we're having. I mean, the yeah. amount of value, the common thing that I get, um, you know, we even the the time of year when we're meeting with clients now, we've kind of changed workloads to where, you know, August through the end of the year, we're trying to get everybody. And yep. because we're after January one, for the most part, there's very little you can do. Yep. And yep. so um, the common thing, and this is our second season of really having this in play with each and every client, 
um, the common thing that we get, and now the software is beautiful because it puts this output out and it says, hey, here's your tax saving. And if we didn't do this, right, we don't push, we don't have the meeting, we don't push the buttons, you missed out on that. Mm -hmm. Or by the way, to, to your story earlier, your RMD starts here. You're 12 years away, right? right. We can yeah. cut that, you know, down to a third of what it is along the way and keeping you in an effective bracket of, you know, somewhere between 10 and 15% for yep. a mass affluent person. Yeah. So yep. the common response I get, Wayne, is why didn't my accountant tell me that? <laughs> right. You got it. And then the second question is, so and then I stopped them there. I said, well, if you like them, don't fire them because they're all the same. Right. right? Yeah. They're the 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 clients think that they're paying their 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 CPA for tax planning they're not they're right. they're paying them to file a return that's right yep and so like there's this misconception of what what this is it's like eye opening and i'm like no like this is what we're doing like you yeah. can, you can take this stuff and go to hr block now cuz you've got all the answers to the test you know yeah, yeah. so that is going to transform the industry um, for the better you yeah. know, uh, people have always wanted to pick on wealth management, um, you know, but it's it's the more value and it's just going to that we're able to add is going to accelerate. You know, it's the yeah. it's the processors like the accountant. I, I look at that as a vendor. Right. If, right. If, yep. if I would be scared if I was just a normal 1040 accounting firm. Right. Mm -hmm. Without commercial and the, the business stuff and or audit, you know, and stuff like yep. that. If I was just doing 1040 returns with AI and and now our industry who controls all the relationships, right? We're the steward. Yeah. You know, it's drastically going to put a dent in that. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think there's meanwhile, there there's amazing, you know, tax strategies that can be used um, to, to manage taxes, even moving into retirement. And some of it is involved, some of it, of it is involving like active participation in, you know, setting up an LLC and being an active participant in the operation of a business. Um, you know, and, and it's, uh, I mean, one of the reasons, so our kids get paid uh, 1099 income to, uh, to, to read books each year. So we, and, and uh, that's, that gives them a uh, 1099 income so that they have the opportunity to operate and function as a, as, as a 1099 contractor for tax purposes. So we actually do tax planning with our kids on that front. Yeah. Um, our kids are 19 to 22. So, you know, b being able to engage clients to, uh, to think three-dimensionally about their tax planning and, and think as a tax strategist, not, not just a tax preparer, right? And that's, that's ultimately, uh, well, that's a huge area where we can add value, so. What, um, are, the, what, what are the, you said three-dimensionally, what are the three? Well, I, I think you know th three dimensionally is 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 both is, is thinking, um, thinking and operating as a business owner versus just a W two employee. So mm -hmm. you know the, the tax code is really built for um, to benefit tax to benefit business owners. So as soon as you can move somebody from just W two income into the world where they've got ten ninety nine income and other forms of other forms of income, you crack open a lot of other opportunities to deduct things that weren't otherwise deductible. So I have, I have two clients uh, who are, um, who, who've set up LLCs and they're, they're um, operating a solar, a solar companies now. Um, and they are, you know, they, they, there's a third party vendor that's helping them with the actual solar projects. Um, but now they're in the year that they retire are retiring. They've got a huge payout on the W2 side. Uh, they're setting up, you know, doing some solar panel projects that are, uh, going to create not just create um, cash flow for the next 20 years they're also going to create massive tax savings this year and now they're operating and they're active actively operating a business so now their travel can be tied to the business their cell phone use and and uh, uh, internet access and and their computer that they had to go buy because the, the company took their computer all that stuff becomes tax deductible to the business when you know and, and they're doing it in the year that they retire so you know there's there's huge benefits so now they're they're moving from w2 income to 1099 income so yeah so anyway that's uh 
fascinating to be able to watch those and and, and work with their CPAs to and see, see the CPAs, you know, and, and help lead the charge with the with the uh, accountants to set this up and and you know position the clients for success. So uh, that yeah, I I would agree with everything you 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 said there. It's uh, it's an exciting time. Yeah, good stuff. Well, Brent, thanks so much for today. Um, I know that you've been really generous with your time with us, and I'm grateful for the stories, the lessons, and, and milestones, uh, hearing about mentors and, and, and uh, kind of what you're trying to do with your family. Um, what's one thing you would leave us with uh, from your journey so far in the area of envisioning more when it comes to finances? Um, I would just say for any young entrepreneurs out there that um, be be intentional about doing thoughtful, nice things for others. And, and, and you got to pour into those people that matter the most in your circle. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't come easy for everybody, right? Um, so uh, uh, being intentional of saying, hey, what are the nice things that I'm doing for whom this week, this month, whatever? Um, it, that the results that you're going to get from random acts of kindness, um, stopping, spending a little bit more time, asking a few more questions, a gift here, a gift there, and just give. Um, so I'd say my, if people can be intentional about it because it doesn't come easy and it's so easy to just go on to the next thing. So, um, be intentional about being thoughtful is, uh, is something that, um, I'm passionate about, and um, I, it, it comes second nature to me now because when it wasn't, you know, now I see all this, all the results and all the good that comes from it. And so now it's at the top of my list just every day when I wake up. That's great. That's good stuff. Thanks so much, uh, Brent. Um, so thank you for sharing another episode with us here at the Envision More podcast. Uh, we're here to help families not just accumulate wealth, but to accelerate wealth and to think about how it's more important what we leave in our kids and what we leave to our kids. Thanks for again for sharing another episode with us. Thank you for listening to the Envision More podcast with Wayne Wagner Jr. of Visionary Wealth Management. We hope you were encouraged and inspired by the conversation today. If you want to dig deeper into the show notes or Wayne's work at Visionary, you can find us at envisionmore.com. That's Envision with a Z. Advisory services are provided through Wealth Plan Investment Management. Wealth Plan Investment Management and Visionary Wealth Management are separate entities. The content is developed from sources believed to be providing accurate information. The information in this material is not intended as tax or legal advice. Please consult legal or tax professionals for specific information regarding your individual situation. The opinions and material provided are for general information and should not be considered a solicitation for the purchase or sale of any security. Thanks for listening.